let's let's focus in now on one alleged Eucharistic miracle. This is one I actually saw with my own eyes, uh, whether it's miraculous or not. I saw what was claimed to be in the year 2000 in Rome, I believe, and this was in Lanciano, Italy. Uh, so I want to ask you what exactly is said to have happened there and how has it been investigated scientifically? And maybe I'll throw up the image of this host, Father. Yeah, actually, before you do the host, sure. why don't you show that uh, the epitaph, the 1636 yep. epitaph, because that actually is. is a, a primary source material right here. So, so I've, I've told to go it's to on the screen. People can see it right now. I mean, it's in it's, Latin, it's I in, guess. <laughs> that's right. So, uh, or, yeah, it might be actually in, I'm not sure if it's Latin or Italian, but, or I translated yeah, it yeah, into English. Italian. I'm just going to read uh, a pretty accurate English translation, just straight up. So okay, what they're for, seeing on the screen from yeah. 1636 translated into English. Um, okay, who wrote this and, and what is it? it it's, it's a stone slab that's in the church in Lanciano, Italy, where this miracle is reported to have happened. Okay. So this is what it says. Around the year of our Lord, 700, in this church, at that time under the title of St. Legonziano, of the monks of St. Basil, a priest monk doubted whether the consecrated host truly was the body of our Savior, and the wine was his blood. He celebrated Mass, said the words of consecration, and he saw the host made flesh, and he saw the wine made blood. Everything was shown to those nearby and then to all the people, and the flesh is still whole, and the blood is unequally divided into five parts. You can see it today in the same way in this chapel. So, and then it, it gives his name and the year and mm -hmm. the date. Okay. So it's a pretty short, kind of pithy description of the events. It has some other things in it, you know, that I skipped over, but we'll get into those things uh, in the analysis. Now, you might hear that and think, well, this is just another one of those pious stories, and they have some some relic that of dubious origin. You know, we don't know where this came from exactly. Uh, so it's it's pretty easy to dismiss it if that's all you had, right? But there is a provenance of, of this thing at least dating back into the you know 1500s. Uh, and now, if you actually look at what it is that was preserved, you know, you can put up that image. Um, and see, this is it. And this is a high resolution photograph uh, from actually a poster that I have right here that I got. I, you know, I asked the, the monks from Lanciano there <laughs> to, uh, you know, send me the, the poster and I scanned it in. It has some lines in it that are a little bit weird because I had to scan it in multiple parts. It's such a big image. Uh, <laughs> wow. But so it's this is allegedly the same host that was referred to in that uh, in that document you just read a moment ago. That's right. This is allegedly 1,300 years old. Okay. Or, yeah, maybe 1,270 or so. <laughs> and uh, is that... Is that uh, around 750 AD is when we think this, that this event happened. Okay. All so right. it's very visible today. It's on display in a kind of a reliquary with the the droplets of coagulated blood that have dried in um, another reliquary underneath it. So uh, they, you can see the color there. And so that's that's the that's sort of the initial part of the the claim is that that this happened and they preserved it and it hasn't degraded over all of this time. OK, but now we need the science, right? Because the, all we have up till now is is just a story, right? So right. the scientific investigation was done in 1970, the first one, by Dr. Eduardo Linoli, who is a professor of anatomy and mm -hmm. pathological histology, so problems with tissues. Uh, and he also has a degree in chemistry and clinical microscopy. So he's good with uh, microscopic photographs and zooming in on things, right? Uh, and there was another professor who kind of checked his work and assisted him in 1970 and 71. And so he took a series of microscopic photographs. And unfortunately, I, I, 
I don't have good color versions of these to show you. <laughs> there are certain books you can get that have some reproductions of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he performed various tests for the presence of blood, different levels of proteins that are found in blood. And he published his results in 1971. And it's actually in, uh, you know, a, a scientific journal that's, that it doesn't exist anymore, but it went out of business. <laughs> it wasn't a peer reviewed journal per se, but it was published in, in an accredited journal. We can say at least that. Mm -hmm. And so I can just give you his findings, the Please. summary of them. Uh, so the first thing he discovered was that the flesh is real flesh. Remind and me again what blood, year he did these experiments or investigations, sorry. 1970. Okay, gotcha. So, so continue, yeah. Yeah. So the flesh is real flesh. The blood is real blood. And there are ways of determining the, the species or the likely species of flesh and blood. And he determined them to be human. Hmm. And the microscopic photography indicated that the flesh consisted of muscular tissue of the heart hmm. because heart tissue has very specific configuration of the fiber uh, fibrils uh, the way they kind of interleave together in different parts of the heart we'll get into that maybe a little bit later for another eucharistic miracle um, so he was able to uh, identify different even different types of heart tissue based on how the striations of the fibers, essentially. I don't want to go into all the technical details, but uh, the other thing he said was that the blood contained other minerals or chlorides and phosphorus, magnesium, just different um, uh, trace elements, but there was no evidence of a preservative. So huh. no evidence of, you know, something that would easily explain why it hadn't just degraded. Hmm. Uh, especially given that it, it wasn't in some hermetically sealed container or anything right. like that for right. century after century. So his conclusion about that was that that, that w in itself was an extraordinary phenomenon. It, it, he didn't have an easy explanation for that. Now, it, there are there is natural mummification. So tissues can dry up and last yep. for a while. And if you exhume bodies, it doesn't necessarily mean that, oh, it's a incorrupt miracle or something if we, you know, if the body is preserved. Uh, but, um, you know, 1300 years is, <laughs> is a very long time under varying conditions as well. Uh, so he found that striking. Another thing he said was that he looked at how thin the slice of tissue was. And he did not think that that could be made except by anatomic dissection, you know, by something, a modern instrument. <laughs> like if someone tried to, he was trying to think, if someone tried to hoax this in medieval times, right? And they got a hold of some cadaver and they decided to take a heart out, you know, <laughs> and use that to create a hoax miracle. They just wouldn't be able to uh, hoax this or it would be uh, at least uh, this, this doctor could not see how to hoax it in the in medieval times so that was you know kind of the, the major findings that he had and he published those did another study in 81 80 and 81 to kind of go into more detail mm -hmm. like trying Please. to find out the yeah. blood type was another okay. thing he was trying to find out and his conclusion was that it was blood type a b okay so that's a, a rare blood type only about five percent of the population has it it does happen to be more pa common in, in the Middle East, but, um, you know, that was his his conclusion about uh, the blood typing. Has, was this, uh, were, were, were investigations done by other uh, doctors or just this one guy? Because it would seem to be a little more credible if you had multiple doctors examining this alleged miracle and coming up with the same results. Certain. Uh, well, same answers. the... The results were double checked, and I don't know the details about how they were double checked by another professor, uh, Professor Ruggiero. So there's, there are documents that show, you know, this kind of double checking. Ruggiero Bertelli of the University of Siena. But 
it's a little tricky to know how independent those two examinations were because yeah. some of the documents say he he was assisted by him so i don't know the details about that in in this case but this is a Could valid it... kind of you know pushback by skeptics is that well why don't they let you know lots of de doctors investigate this you know frequently now the problem right. is that there's a little bit of, of maybe a sense of if this is a holy thing, you know, do we want to just keep on sending it out to different scientists every every month or every year or whenever anyone requests? So I, I can understand that there's this kind of, you know, picking and choosing, just like the shroud doesn't get uh, put out for scientific yep. testing every, every year, right? Thank you for watching this clip. You can click here to watch the full episode. And I want to say a big thanks to our sponsors and to our amazing patrons for making all of this possible. Please do us a favor before you go, click that subscribe button and then the bell. And that way YouTube will be forced to let you know every time we put out a new episode.